Hey guys, my name is Ryan and welcome to Overwatch Central. So this is part two of a video series that we're doing with Jane. Last time we focused on how to realistically watch the pros both in the Overwatch League and on their streams to improve your own games. Today we're going to be talking about how to actually analyse and break down what's happening in the Overwatch League games but also in your own games to work out your issues that you need to fix and become a better player and analyst overall. You can check out all of Jane's details in the description below but again we'll get straight into today's video. You've watched hundreds of games now of the Overwatch League and analysed them and broken them down in a very quick fashion as well. You can see a fight, you notice what happens and the reel could be still rolling and you could go, oh the reason why they won this fight was X, Y and Z. Whereas it takes people like myself and other people, you know, they have to keep watching it back and retakes it. It's almost like this um, analytical dyslexia where you can't necessarily read what's going on in the game. So somebody that's got so good at that over the past few months what advice would you give for somebody that's either trying to watch the Overwatch League and try and get a bigger understanding of what's actually going on in these fights, or somebody that actually wants to follow a similar uh, route as you to be more of an analytical role within a team or even a coach as well? How would you go about trying to teach people how to actually read Overwatch? Well, the stories that happen during a fight always come back to the ultimates that are available for either team. And between the team fights, and this... Let's 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 take a step back. The higher level players, once you go uh, into Grandmaster and Top 500, will begin what's called ult tracking. So they're keeping track of which ultimates their team has and which ultimates they're going to use together and when. Um, because if you can use uh, two ultimates to win a team fight, then you, even though you had four available, you can keep those other two that you didn't use for the next fight. So using the bare minimum of ultimates required to actually win a fight is one of the really kind of artistic ways of playing Overwatch is, yes, we could win this fight if we just blew all four of our ultimates at the same time, but if we can win this fight right here, right now, with only two ultimates, we'll have those remaining two, probably, plus another one coming online for the next fight to win that one as well. Would you say the majority of that then is just ult economy? Because I remember speaking to Hayes when I was out at the Overwatch League and he said, if you want to learn the game, all you really need to do is to look at the top third of the screen, just see who has what ultimates that's, going from that's, there. That's, you could kind of consider it the prologue, right? Once you see kind of which person has their glowing blue icon ready, you can kind of already tell how it's going to unfold. So let's say you have um, a Genji, red team Genji has his blade available and blue team uh, Zenyatta has his transcendence available. Well, already the gears are turning. How is this going to play out? How is this going to play out, right? There's three different ways, really, that you could see this happening. Um, if the Genji does not know that the Zenyatta has transcendence, the Genji is probably going to go in, whip out his blade, try and hack a few people down. Zenyatta is going to transcendence. It's going to be done. And then blue team, you know, having pushed in, saved themselves from the blade, will probably win the fight. But if red team Genji knows that blue team Zenyatta has the transcendence, he could fake. So Blade actually isn't that valuable of an ultimate. And trading Blade for transcendence is really good. So the Genji could dash up into the sky, pull out his Blade, pretend to go after the Zenyatta, but at the last second, right after Zenyatta pops his trance, he dashes back to his team. And then red team sits there basically until blue team's transcendence runs out and then once transcendence is down then they all die of the zenyatta so there's this kind of whole gameplay of does red team know what blue team's ults are and then after you see the status of the ults you can kind of start to imagine which plays would actually win the team or win would win the team fight do they have soldier okay so if soldier knows he has ultimate where is he positioning and if the other team knows that Soldier has his ultimate, what are they going to do and how are they going to do it to make sure that they don't all die to the nano visor on the high ground? So you could consider the ultimate bar, the top third of the screen, being the little tiny blue circles because everything starts with the ultimates. So if you're trying to understand Overwatch and why people are doing what they're doing, yeah, yeah, yeah start with the ultimates and you'll work your way up from there. Other than sort of ult economy there then as well, what other things would you specifically be looking out for? Uh, maybe the kill feed, the hero compositions. You mentioned uh, Soldier. 
Now, I've seen a lot more teams in the Overwatch League, especially for Season 2, running Soldier over Genji, and I don't know if it was you or somebody else that said it was more like a consistent dive that they were running. They had uh, a few more options, but running a Genji instead of a Soldier meant that you had more burst damage overall, that meant you could actually kill and confirm a lot of people. So, what other aspects of the game are you looking for when you're trying to work out, okay, there's this big burly fight, this is the team that's going to come out on top, this is exactly what's going to happen because I think a lot of the time once you have that knowledge on the game you can just basically guess how these fights are going to go before they've even started. Yeah so one of the there's a couple phases to every team fight we all know of the regrouping phase it's the it's the phase that doesn't happen in platinum right that's the one we joke about everyone just constantly staggers and trickles themselves in but you know at the higher levels as soon as a fight is known to be lost the you know the rest of their team will suicide or get back into spawn and then group back up at six so they can attack the team once more so that's like the regrouping phase and then there's this kind of weird in-between phase where the two teams have come within line of sight of each other that you know the defenders have set up in their position where they're defending and the attackers have set up in their position whichever flank route they chose to actually attack the defenders so there's the team fight phase which is when they're all kind of like brawling in the middle and ults are going off and people are dying and you know all this really craziness that's the chaotic part where you know, if a fight devolves, then it's that's the team fight. But there's this part between regrouping and the actual fighting that's called either the posturing or the poking phase. Whatever you want to call it, up to you. But this phase is basically where both teams are kind of jockeying for position, trying to whittle down the other team from range before they engage. So if you have two compositions and one of them has a soldier and the other one has a genji the soldier has the advantage at range so this is another thing you're going to be want to looking for if you're trying to understand uh overwatch league games or really pro matches is pretty much who has the advantage at range and if both teams kind of stood apart from one another at let's say 20 meters or 50 meters or whatever the sight lines on that map are who would have the advantage and this will dictate which routes people are going to attack you know if uh, if it, if people are defending with you know a bastion or double hit scan or anything like that they're going to really want really nice sight lines but if you're defending with a genji for example you're not going to play in the open you're going to play around corners and then as they come in close you're going to hard engage on them so you either want the the poke or the posture phase to be very small period of time or if you have a lot rate like long range high damage heroes like soldier then you want to be playing in these exposed areas those longer sight lines where you can actually get more value out of your hero so the compositions themselves who has long range who has more burst damage who has more healing who has more utility all of that will dictate where the teams set up and how the teams attack one another nicely sort of summed up there and i guess penultimately because we've gone over quite a lot here We've gone over how to sort of analyze the pro games, which I guess as well, I think you'll quickly sort of sum up. It's more about the more games that you actually look and analyze, the better you'll get. It's practice, right? Yeah, in the same way that when you, you know, learning a new hero, you always have to kind of find the limits of the hero, for example. You know, you want to find what happens. And then after you've got kind of a general understanding, you want to experiment and confirm your hypothesis by practicing. Uh, it's the same way. When you start out watching games, you try and predict as early as possible in the fights who's going to win based on ultimates, based on positioning, based on how you've seen the players playing in the past. And you'll, you know, you may start out with a 50 50. You're like, I think blue team wins. Ah, damn, it was red team. Like, it's worth adding that, like, hexagrams in the Overwatch League as a caster does that. And there's nothing wrong with it as well, being able to go, oh, London look like they're going to win out this fight. And then it's actually New York. And it's like, well, that's the Korean teams. They're very hard to gauge. Like, it's okay to make calls to an extent and actually have them wrong. Oh, yeah. Especially when you're still learning it. And and when things go wrong, and once you get to, like, the a level of analysis or, you know, understanding which you actually feel confident, you're still only going to get about 80% of the guesses right because somebody's going to come up clutch or somebody's going to make a mistake, and those factors are always completely unpredictable. I've got a saying on my stream when we're talking about um, team fights uh, where... The plan matters for the first 10 seconds. So if a team fight lasts like 10 to 20 seconds, the team with the better plan will win. You know, it doesn't matter if the one side had a McCree with 50% accuracy and the other one had a McCree with a 60% accuracy. If the team fight 
happens and it only lasts like 10, 20 seconds, then what the key influence on who won is going to be the strategy, the plan, the compositions, the macro level plays. But when team fights evolve into an absolute chaotic mess, this is where this is where individual mechanics, skill, clutch plays, you know, chokes, this is where like the real knit and grit, this is where the twitch clips get born. So if you watch New York, for example, if you're looking at any of the huge clips where say Biolbi just pops off, you know, where he touches with a fraction of a second left in overtime, or where he got that 4K on Oasis, if you're looking at those moments, you're gonna notice that they always occur after of like a, a team fight has been going on or has become chaotic for like 30 seconds or more because once those once strategy has gone out of the window right no plan survives first contact with the enemy once all of your planning your composition your pretty diagrams have gone out the window the only thing that matters is mechanical skill and individual plays so and once you get to that phase all bets are off no one could predict and uh it's just so fascinating and exciting to watch. Definitely, and that's the main thing. To sort of go on to that then, if you're not watching or analyzing the Overwatch League, you should be analyzing yourself. Or maybe if you're in that situation where you're trying to like coach another player or trying to look at your own mistakes, what are you looking for? How can you improve on your own analysis of the game, either on yourself or the pros or on other people that you may know? Well, whether you're just playing the game or looking at a recording of your game, if you have that sort of setup where you have the capability to do so, the thing that you want to look at to determine your own ability to improve is trying to look at what caused you to die. That's, that's the first step into improving or analyzing your own play. Uh, is you know trying to figure out what you die what you died to and could it have pre been prevented? So if you get in, you know, if you're playing McCree and you get in a one v one with the other the enemy McCree and you lose, then was it because he had better aim than you? Well, then maybe you need to be spending some more time in the practice range grinding out your aim. Were you a Zenyatta, for example, and you got killed by an errant Junkrat bomb or something like that? Was it because your positioning was too poor or too exposed that Junkrat was actually able to just get a lucky bomb on you? Where would have a safer location been for you to hold and still contribute to your team? Or, you know, did you, again, playing Zenyatta, uh, four members of your team died and you got attacked by a Winston, so you used Transcendence to save yourself. But you used Transcendence, you survived, but the rest of your team was already dead and you didn't win the team fight. Well, that's an issue with your game sense or your understanding of basically the macro level Overwatch. Um, and basically, if you use an ultimate and you did not win the team fight overall, so if, if you win or if you use an ultimate and then after the dust has settled, your team is not the one standing tall, then your ultimate, regardless of how it used or how it was used, was wasted. So trying to think about your actions that cause your death and whether you just misunderstood the state of the you know the state of the board so to speak about who had advantage or who's winning this team fight or you know I could get three kills here this is um this is actually a great example right if you're playing soldier and let's say that the enemy Reinhardt dies to a sticky bomb like your tracer stickies Reinhardt and kills him. So the, the enemy has five people alive and you have six people alive, right? You have Visor. Do you pop Visor? You could easily get a 4K now that the shield's gone, right? The answer is usually no. Um, ultimates are used to gain an advantage over the opponent, but what you have, once you have that advantage, you could normally extend it without the use of your ultimates. So if, it, if a fight is 6v5, so if the, if the defenders only have five people on their team and they're missing a shield, then your team should be able to win simply by being outnumbered and having more resources. So instead of using Visor to clean up the enemy team and get the play of the game, it would be much better in those situations to just save your Visor and mow people down by aiming manually. So 
there's a lot of different things to take into consideration uh, when talking about game sense and when do I ultimate. But if you're gold or platinum, uh, the biggest difference between a gold, a platinum player, and somebody who has made it to diamond is that a diamond player will use their ultimate much better and it will be wasted uh, way fewer. Now, ultimates are still wasted in diamond. They're still wasted in masters and grandmasters. We'll be awesome. We'll be honest, but um, the amount of the amount of wasted ultimates. Uh, in platinum and gold is actually rather ridiculous. So, if you wanna, if you wanna just get some easy SR gains, and you're in gold or platinum right now, just be more critical about your own ultimate usage in your games. There's loads to go over. You could go in depth with every single hero that's in the game, and just to sort of finish on, then I guess any final bits of information that you really want to go over, just nice and quickly, and then also where can people find more analysis from you, both for the Overwatch League both for VOD reviews and also review of yourself as well, which I guess is important. So any final thoughts you really want to highlight in this video and where can people find more from you? My goodness, if you let me, I could probably talk the whole day through, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking your viewers' ears off, so I'll just leave it with uh, thank you for listening. I hope you found one tidbit of wisdom in this uh, video that was of use to you. My name again is Jane. I'm an Overwatch coach and analyst. Uh, you can find me, I stream uh, every weekend as well as during the week at twitch.tv slash Jane. That's J-A-Y-N-E. I hope to see you around and thank you so much Ryan for the invitation. I had a lot of fun. And that's it for this time. Thank you very much for watching. Again, you can check out all of Jane's details in the description below. Very useful if you want to learn and find a more educational streamer to watch nowadays. But thanks for watching. Take care. We'll see you next time.